Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Schwartz, and I'm the president of Refugees International. Uh, tomorrow marks the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. And we are delighted to have you join us today for our commemoration of this event and discussion of the implications of the convention and the 1967 refugee protocol. By their terms, the convention and its protocol aspire to provide protection to those who have fled their countries of origin and have well-founded fears of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership in a social group or political opinion. But the convention has also served as a critical guidepost to assess both progress and failures in the effort to protect those who must flee. And as some 80 million people worldwide are now displaced due to persecution, due to violations of human rights, due to conflict, and as the world grapples with new drivers of forced displacement, the convention merits our scrutiny. For this reason, we are delighted to host this event featuring the Honorable Harold Hung Ju Ko, who is currently Senior Advisor to the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor. Harold, whom I will introduce shortly, will offer remarks and then have a brief discussion with a distinguished panel. If and as our time permits, we will also field questions from our audience. But first, we will have the pleasure of hearing from U.S. Representative Joseph D. Neguz of Colorado, who will join us by video. Representative Neguz, whose parents fled Eritrea in the early 1980s, now serves as vice chair of the House of Representatives Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship. He has been a strong advocate for the protection of people around the world who have fled persecution and violence. It is my honor to introduce Representative Joseph Neguz. Hi. My name is Joe Neguse, and I have the honor of representing Colorado in the United States Congress. I'm so honored to join you for this virtual event on the 70th anniversary of the Refugee Convention. And I wanna give a big thank you to Refugees International for your consistent, passionate work in advocating for life-saving assistance, human rights, and protection for displaced peoples. At a time when the international community's ability to respond to these crises is stretched so thin, your powerful advocacy is more important than ever. And your voice, your expertise is crucial as we work to repair America's moral authority on refugee resettlement in the wake of the Trump administration's full-scale assault on our American ideals. America has long been a beacon of hope to refugees around the world, including to my own family. This is part of our legacy as a country and one we must continue to protect and uphold. My parents came to the U.S. over 40 years ago, fleeing a war-torn country in East Africa. They became naturalized citizens and they never took for granted the freedoms and the opportunities that the United States gave them and their children. They were able to make a home in America, able to offer me and my sister a life full of opportunity, safety, and security because of the core value and promise that America was founded on, to accept those uprooted by war and persecution and violence. We have to ensure that this promise remains attainable always to other immigrants and other refugees like my parents. As you know, while in office, President Trump set historically low targets for refugee admissions, abandoning America's commitment to those that need us most. That is not a legacy that we can continue. As the co-chair of the Bipartisan Refugee Caucus, I have joined with my colleagues in imploring President Biden and his administration to raise U.S. refugee admission targets from the historically low levels set under President Trump. I'm grateful that President Biden has begun to make progress in this regard, but there remains more work to be done. We can once more lead the world in refugee resettlement and stand firm in our values of compassion, of offering shelter and safety to those around the world fleeing from unfathomable harm and violence. This issue is a personal one for me and my family. And as long as I am in Congress, I'll continue to advocate for the rights of refugees seeking shelter in our country. Thank you to Refugees International 
for inviting me to share my story with all of you and for giving me the chance to discuss how I think that we can improve our treatment of refugees through congressional leadership. I wish you the best for a spirited panel discussion, and I'm grateful again for the work that you are doing to support and advocate for refugees. Thanks so much. Thank you, Representative Magoos, for those really meaningful remarks. Uh, it is now my distinct pleasure and honor uh, to introduce State Department uh, Senior Advisor, uh, Harold Hongju Ko, whom we've asked to deliver keynote remarks on the convention. Uh, I could spend the rest of the hour on Harold Ko's biography, uh, Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School and former Dean of that institution, former State Department Legal Advisor, former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Rights and Labor, and one of the country's leading experts on public international law. I will also take a moderator's prerogative to note that I've worked closely with and across from Harold Coe, I think for about 30 years. Uh, in fact, back in 1992, uh, when I was a staff consultant on the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, uh, Harold Coe testified and advocated on behalf of the International Refugee Protection Act, which my boss at the time, Steve Solars, had sponsored in response to the George H.W. Bush Kennebunkport order restricting entry of Haitian refugees. Um, and I had the distinct pleasure of working with Harold in both the Clinton and Obama administrations. Uh, after senior advisor Co offers his remarks, we'll have a panel uh, with three distinguished guests, Mustafa Aliou, uh, Rez Gardi, and Yael Shaker, whom I will introduce in greater detail uh, after uh, Senior Advisor Co completes his remarks. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Honorable Harold Hongju Ko. Uh, thank you, Eric. <laughs> On behalf of the Biden-Harris administration, I wanna thank Dean Eric Schwartz, who as he mentioned is my longtime brother in the foxhole and your invaluable organization, Refugees International, to give me this opportunity to reflect on the Refugee Convention at 70. Uh, for me, this 70th anniversary, which as you mentioned, we mark tomorrow, is both a personal and professional milestone for me. It's a personal one because the lifetime of the convention has encompassed my own lifetime, dating back to the 60s when America took in my late father a political refugee from South Korea when the democratic government was deposed by the military coup. He served the democratic government and was exiled to the United States, which gave him political asylum and which made my life in America possible. It's a professional milestone because of the years I've spent both inside and outside the government fighting to enforce the convention's provisions. America's profound refugee legacy includes so many refugee offspring like uh, Representative Nagus who have supported your cause these many years. And so many like me who have been moved by the gift we've received from the convention to try to repay our debt through government service around the world. Uh, as Eric mentioned, this is my fourth time in the US government and my fifth decade working on refugee issues. I started in the 80s at the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department, second in the 90s, litigating against the US government on behalf of Haitian and Cuban refugees, and working with Eric at the House Foreign Affairs Committee, later as Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor in the Clinton administration, working hand in glove with Eric when he was Senior Director of Humanitarian Affairs at the National Security Council. In the 2000s and 2010s, we were both at the State Department, Eric at the Refugee Bureau and I as legal advisor under President Obama and then Secretary Hillary Clinton working to promote United States adherence to our convention obligations. And today in 2021, I speak as senior Biden appointee currently at the same office of the legal advisor, describing our efforts in these first 200 days to advance the sound development of international law and the practices taken pursuant to the protocol. Let me do two things on this 70th birthday. First, celebrate the historic accomplishments of the convention 
as landmark events in international law, both the convention and the protocol were watershed achievements that continue to guide the international community in this approach to refugee crises. Second, let me reaffirm a basic reality that I hope is evident to all of you. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to restore America's highest values to the center of our foreign policy and to offer reassurances to persecuted people. We will protect vulnerable people. Even in this time of challenge and stress, under the Biden-Harris administration, the US is determined to alleviate the suffering of refugees globally through leadership and refugee affairs, whether that means refugee resettlement, promoting durable solutions for refugees, providing humanitarian assistance and diplomacy, improving refugee protection, or upholding our international legal obligations. Let me speak first about the achievements. 70 years after the fact, international lawyers sometimes forget what a stunning advance in international law this treaty marked. Like earlier efforts, the 51 Convention was directed to fix a particular problem. It was adopted after World War II when the international community was confronting a massive refugee crisis, but for refugees of European origin. In the preceding decades, a handful of ad hoc movements had sought to address specific refugee situations, such as persons displaced from the former Ottoman Empire, the USSR, or Nazi Germany. But while these efforts furthered the idea of international protection for persecuted groups, their scope was narrow, not global. They applied only to specific national, ethnic, or religious groups, or to those who had been displaced from a particular country. Indeed, even the predecessor organization to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees focused only on displaced victims of the Nazis and the fascists, as well as other people who were considered refugees before World War II. So the original convention was narrowly drawn. It had temporal limits. To be a refugee, an individual had to have been displaced because of events occurring before January 1, 1951. And it had geographic limits. State parties could, if they wanted, only treat persons as refugees if they had been displaced by events that occurred in Europe. But the core concepts of the convention were global and groundbreaking. It was negotiated by delegates from 26 countries from every continent. And 16 years later, the 1967 protocol eliminated these temporal and optional geographic limitations. So today's convention is capacious, inclusive, and global in focus and scope. 149 countries are now party to the Convention or Protocol. The UN High Commissioner on Refugees is currently working in 132 countries, some of which are not even parties to the Convention or Protocol, demonstrating the Convention's global normative impact. The two great intellectual advances of the Convention were Article 1, its remarkably broad and forward-looking definition of refugee, and Article 33, the non refoulement provision, the historic protection against refoulement, the forced return of refugees to their persecutors, and accompanied by a set of core civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights and protections designed to increase based upon a refugee's level of attachment to the state in which they were located. As Eric mentioned, the convention's first article defines a refugee as someone outside the country of his or her nationality, who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, and is unable or owing to such fear, unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country. The advantages, unlike earlier efforts, this forward-looking definition was not restricted by national or ethnic group. It was not limited to people fleeing specific persecutors. The drafters declined to define and limit the scope of what would qualify as either political opinion or particular social group. So this broad definitional language as supplemented by the 67 convention has over the decades enabled the convention to adapt to changing circumstances and to become even more central to the international system protection today than it was at its adoption. The core of the Article 33 non refoulement provision was simple and clear. As my late boss, Harry Blackman, put it in the Haitian refugee case, vulnerable refugees shall not be returned. This bedrock principle of non refoulement has guided international responses to crises recently in Burma, Syria, 
uh, uh, congressman in Nagusa's home country of Ethiopia and elsewhere, requiring continued vigilance and support to refugee hosting countries. I'd love to say that the decades since 1951 have been years of unbroken progress. But as everyone here knows, we observed this sobering anniversary while we're experiencing the highest displacement worldwide ever recorded. As of 2020, more than 82 million people were forcibly displaced, of whom more than 26 million were refugees. So plainly, the convention cannot and has not been a cure-all for the global displacement crises. By only addressing refugees who cross borders, the convention famously did not purport to address persons who are internally displaced or displaced solely for reasons other than persecution, for example, by war, generalized violence, natural disasters, climate change, or dire economic circumstances. Although the convention's preamble recognizes that durable solutions require international cooperation, the convention creates no burden sharing mechanism or obligation. And as time has gone on, new and unanticipated sources of upheaval, including COVID-19, protracted conflicts, accelerating impacts of climate change have made this a time of historic global displacement. Given these challenges, Eric, your work and that of Refugees International, other refugee organizations and all who support these organizations in enforcing the centrality of the Refugee Convention and Protocol has never been more vital. Which brings me to the second half of these remarks. Given these enormous challenges, how is the Biden administration working in its first months to restore and strengthen our leadership in four vital areas? One, refugee resettlement. Two, humanitarian assistance and diplomacy. Three, protection. And four, long-term solutions. Let me say a word about each. First, refugee resettlement. The Biden administration has continued to significantly increase refugee resettlement to the United States, in particular settlement of refugees from Central America. At state, the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, which Eric led so ably, heads the humanitarian response to refugee and migration crises, including by managing the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program in coordination with DHS and HHS. In so doing, U.S. domestic treatment of refugees and asylum seekers strengthens U.S. humanitarian leadership globally, modeling good practice, and we hope persuading other governments to strengthen their own protection policies. As everybody knows, after four dark years, the U.S. is finally taking up the mantle of leadership on refugee resettlement again, including through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, which has settled more than 3.1 million refugees since 1980. We've already taken the critical steps of raising the annual refugee admissions target to 62,500 for fiscal year 2021 and restored regional allocations for resettlement to ensure that access to that program is based on refugee vulnerability. We're trying to build a system that responds effectively to emergency need for resettlement across all regions of the world and that reflects the US tradition of welcoming and not scapegoating refugees. Second, humanitarian assistance and diplomacy. The US remains the world's largest single donor of humanitarian assistance, providing more than 10 and a half billion in the last fiscal year globally, including for refugees. By so doing, we play a central role in mobilizing and strengthening the international response to displacement crises. US contributions support the UN High Commissioner for Refugees mandate, and we complement our financial support with rigorous oversight of UNHCR's operations and policy. And it's not just money. Through diplomacy led by Eric's old Bureau PRM, the US supports a range of international organizations and non-governmental organizations to help protect the rights of refugees and promote respect for the principle of non refoulement. Just last month, for example, the US participated in the Venezuela Donors Conference our UN ambassador, Linda Thomas Greenfield, commended the governments and citizens of 17 countries throughout the region that generously hosted the majority of 5.6 million Venezuelans who've been forced to flee their country. Efforts by the governments of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and other countries to regularize the status of Venezuelan refugees and migrants, to strengthen access to asylum and access to healthcare and legal employment all find their roots in the core principles of the Refugee Convention and Protocol. Area three, expanding protection. 
While protection gaps remain, the international community has taken steps to address other situations of vulnerability, whether through offering temporary protection to displaced persons, broadening the scope of protection through regional arrangements or treaties, and supporting the visions and principles of the Global Compact for Refugees, including regional implementation of the Comprehensive Regional Response Framework. With regard to Article 33, the US remains committed to respect the ultimate protection principle, the prohibition against non-refoulement. And we urge all countries to follow this cardinal principle of protection. The U.S. remains further committed to providing a safe and orderly processing of humanitarian protection seekers. And in our own country, the United States is rebuilding our humanitarian protection system, unwinding policies that required non-citizens to, quote, remain in Mexico pending adjudication of their cases in the United States. And we are suspending and terminating three bilateral agreements that allowed for the transfer of certain qualifying humanitarian protection seekers to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador for these non-citizens to seek asylum or equivalent temporary protection there instead. Amid a global public health crisis, we of course must continue to prioritize public health and safety at the borders during the pandemic. But at the same time, we're working to streamline a system for identifying and processing into the United States, particularly vulnerable individuals who warrant humanitarian exemptions to the public health order under Title 42 of the US Code. And we're working to ensure that this global system of protection is more inclusive of and responsive to the needs of less visible minorities, for example, LGBTQI persons, who across the world are threatened, tortured, and killed for sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, or because they may not conform to dominant social and cultural norms. These persons continue to face serious threats at home and in countries of asylum where they may be isolated and reluctant to help. Section four of executive order 14010 from February of this year directs Homeland Security and the Department of Justice to publish by October 30th, 2021, a joint rule that addresses the circumstances in which a person should be considered a member of a particular social group as that term is used in the definition of refugee as derived from the Refugee Convention and the Protocol. Since then, a working group comprised of participants from DHS, DOJ, and the State Department has been convening diligently to discuss the policy principles and legal considerations relevant to this rulemaking, which will conclude by the end of the year. Fourth and finally, searching for broader solutions. This administration is doing its utmost to address the root causes of irregular migration in Central America, including forced displacement of refugees and internally displaced persons. As I've long argued in my academic work, all too often the US reacts robustly to the fallout of refugee crises without addressing the root causes. We address the symptom and not the disease. But upon taking office, the Biden administration immediately laid out a comprehensive approach to migration that includes addressing root causes of irregular migration collaboratively managing migration in the region, expanding lawful pathways for protection and opportunity in the US. This approach includes a root causes strategy supported by a comprehensive multi-year, $4 billion plan in Central America that aims to expand economic opportunity, strengthen democratic governance and root out corruption, to bolster human rights, improve citizen security and put an end to pervasive gender-based violence in Northern Central America over the long term, so that individuals can be safe and proper, prosper and be at home. Our comprehensive approach includes the so-called CMMS, the Comprehensive Collaborative Migration Management Strategy. It's the first US whole of government effort focused on creating and expanding lawful pathways and services for individuals in North and Central America who are already migrating displaced or contemplating leaving their homes. The CMMS calls for a range of actions, including enhancing access to international protection and in-country protection, promoting temporary labor programs within the region, strengthening legal pathways for those who choose to migrate or are forcibly displaced from their homes, and fostering humane border management practices. And in our effort to find broader solutions, we're focused not just on the most challenged geographic regions, 
Indeed, following executive order 14013, the State Department is working others across the federal government to prepare a report to the president on the global impacts of climate change on migration. Refugee International's task force on climate change and migration has been a key interlocutor for us during the external consultations to formulate this report. And we're so grateful for the willingness of RI and others to share their expertise on this complex topic. In closing, obviously, I've only scratched the surface of the challenges we face together. But we have not yet been in office for 200 days. I know it feels like a long time, but it has not been that long. And this is only one of the challenges we've been tackling, along with climate change, a global, and as we see, resurging pandemic, America's physical and human infrastructure, voting rights, and restoring America's image and influence in the world. Like any 70-year-old legal instrument, the Refugee Convention does not address every problem we face today. It cannot be the only international legal means of protection for forced migrants. So as the decades have unfolded, it's become clear that we must do this through a public-private partnership whereby refugee-led organizations like RI engage with national governments, international organizations, and UNHCR to promote greater inclusion in national and international policy making on refugee issues. But while our time has been short, this administration is determined to listen, to act, and to offer root cause solutions. Even in just half a year, we hope that you, the audience, are feeling the difference. After all, as they say, we've only just begun. So thank you so much for listening. I'm honored to be here. I thank my good friend, Eric, and I very much look forward to the conversation that will follow. Well, thank you, Harold, so much for those comments. And you will get uh, a lot of uh, questions, um, as you know, some of which will be critical. But I, I just want to say getting a public and comprehensive statement from the administration on an issue like this one is so extremely valuable. And, and so I, I think we, we all benefit by having uh, a statement of that comprehensiveness uh, out there in the public domain. So thank you for that. And thank you for your comments and thank you for your, um, for your commitment. Um, so now what we're gonna do is spend probably about, we have until about, uh, we may, we have until about 2.10, uh, not, not until about 2.10, we have until 2.10. So we're gonna use that time, probably about half the time We'll have a panel discussion uh, and questions to uh, to Harold, and then the rest we'll, we will field questions uh, from the audience. So let me um, introduce our our, our panelists. Um, uh, our, uh, Mustafa Alio is currently the managing director of Our Seat, which is uh, refugees seeking equal access at the table. Our Seat is an international project that aims to increase refugee inclusion at global policymaking tables within 20 countries across the world. During the Global Refugee Forum in December 2019, Mustafa became the first ever refugee advisor to a Canadian delegation at a meeting of the international refugee system. We will also be joined by Rez Gardi, co-managing director of Our Seat. Rez is a human rights lawyer and activist who was born in a UN refugee camp in Pakistan after her Kurdish family had fled Kurdistan. She was awarded the Young New Zealander of the Year uh, in 2017 for her services to human rights. She represented New Zealand in the first ever global refugee youth consultations and helped form the Global Youth Advisory Council to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Both Mustafa and Rez are involved in the noble effort to translate the vision of refugee agency and inclusion in global decision-making into reality. And our eagerness to have them join this panel reflects our perspective on the importance of the work in which they are engaged. We look forward to their comments and questions on the relevance of, the ref of refugee inclusion in meeting uh, the objectives of the convention at 70. And we'll be joined by Yael Shaker, a senior uh, U.S. advocate at Refugees International, where she focuses on asylum, U.S. refugee admissions, temporary protected status, and immigration practices 
that have protection implications. Before Refugees International, Yael spent a decade researching the relationship between immigration and refugee policy for her forthcoming book on the history of asylum. She's also taught at the University of Connecticut and lectured on immigration history and refugee policy at Harvard Law School and the University of Minnesota, go golfers, and at the Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, focused on direct legal representation uh, on behalf of those seeking asylum. So before I uh, turn to our panelists, um, I'm gonna, uh, uh, again, use the, the moderator's prerogative to, to ask Carol an initial question, and then we will turn to, um, uh, to Mustafa and Rez, uh, and then following that to Yael. So Harold, if I may ask uh, an initial question. Um, over the years, uh, UNHCR has produced a handbook interpreting the convention, numerous legal papers to guide state practice. The 1980 Refugee Act incorporated the UN's refugee de definition into US law and in an important uh, early decision interpreting the act, the Refugee Act, the Supreme Court recognized the UN handbook as a guide. Uh, in the 1990s as well, UNHCR and Canadian guidelines helped US officials develop policies regarding the handling of refugee claims by women and children. So how, how do you think UNHCR and other state interpretations of the convention as a living document uh, might or should inform uh, US policymakers today? Yeah, thank you for asking that question, uh, Eric. The, this might seem like a narrow question of law or jurisprudence, but it's actually a huge issue with regard to how much legal protection the United States is required to give to refugees. And um, there are basically in uh, legal circles two approaches. What, one is um, what I would call a kind of outward looking approach, the one that you just des described, which is to see the Refugee Act as part of a broad global legal landscape. In, in fact, the words are the same words. Um, uh, including words like political opinion or particular social group. All the more important is that a particular social group uh, could extend to people like women or women facing gender violence or domestic violence or uh, LGBTQ individuals who were not protected by the traditional categories of race, uh, nationality, or religion that are enumerated in the text. So construction of this language will determine, Steve Legonski recently put in a blog post, the three little words that mean the difference between life and death. Now, if you take this outward looking approach, you look to see how UNHCR is construed it, and you see how other countries have construed these same words. And you engage in an act of intellectual dialogue. And there, you know, the Canadians, the New Zealanders um, have taken a very, uh, uh, broad and um, uh, capacious view. The other way to look is what I call a nationalist approach or a textualist approach, which we associate in this country with Justice Scalia and a particular movement within the, uh, uh, the legal academy, which says, what does particular mean? What does social mean? What does group mean? And that doesn't want to look to legislative history, that doesn't want to look to the history of the treaty, that doesn't want to look to foreign influences, and says this is an American law and we should construe it in light of these uh, American words. And as you can imagine, that approach, which was particularly taken by the Trump administration, leads to a much more restrictive reading of a term like particular social group. And so part of the exercise uh, that's going on on the interagency is a discussion about whether in construing these words for the Biden administration and beyond, we should be adopting uh, 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 a, an approach that shares and borrows from other countries or whether we should maintain restriction to a purely American approach. Um, and you know, there are people who say you shouldn't borrow that, um, well, in constitutional law, justices like Alito or um, John Roberts would say, um, this is American law. You can't borrow from some other country. 
To which my response is, uh, have you ever had a kimchi taco? <laughs> you know, <laughs> have you ever had American, uh, uh, an American eat a taco in which they put kimchi in it? That's what Americans do, they're borrowers. You know, kimchi tacos are as American as frankfurters or hot dogs or apple cooking or, you know, uh, ap uh, apple pie. We are borrowers. And so the outward looking borrowing comparing to the globe approach is the approach which is uniquely American. After all, the Declaration of, in of Independence said we pay decent respect to the opinions of mankind. You know, we're not just operating in a bubble. So this seemingly technical jurisprudential debate about whether you take an outward looking approach or an inward looking textualist approach will be very meaningful in terms of the actual breadth of the convention's interpretation in our country in the years ahead. So thank you for asking the question. Thank you, Harold. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. And with that in mind, I'm gonna propose uh, something because I wanna turn to Mustafa and Therese. Um, and I, 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 we hadn't discussed um, you know, who of the, 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 the two of you would speak first. But what I'd like to do is invite each of you uh, to comment uh, and, and raise a question for Harold and ask him to field or react to both of your comments. And that, again, with a view towards looking at the clock, if that works for, if that works for each of you. Uh, Musaba? I was gonna say Riz, ladies first. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you all um, on an esteemed panel, and it's a pleasure to uh, be invited by Refugees International. Um, I guess I just wanted to um, really emphasize what um, Senior Advisor Co has said about the nature of the convention, the fact that it was um, developed in and for a different era. Um, but of course, you know, while the convention's criteria are limited and outdated, as to be expected with any international treaty, and its wording is vague, um, overall the convention's definition of a refugee has proven itself capable of a dynamic um, interpretation over time, and we have seen this common uh, pattern in Western countries for creative interpretation and expansion of convention gr uh, grounds by the judiciary. Um, attempt to, attempting to include uh, modern day people in situations under its protection that reflect the era that we now live in. For instance, gender related persecution um, is uh, now being accepted around the globe um, in refugee claims, um, and even so in the United States jurisprudence. Um, I, I would really like to uh, really go to the aspect of um, how displaced people can be more meaningfully included in decision making. Um, we have seen the importance of refugee participation um, highlighted in a number of for, uh, fora in terms of the uh, positive benefits it has, uh, although a number of obstacles still hinder that participation of refugees, um, indicating that we need to develop more effective measures. Um, so I would like to ask, uh, senior advisor Co, how can we turn this uh, rhetoric Rick, um, of commitment to refugee participation, um, the support and pledges that have been made around the globe, um, and turn that into meaningful change in practice um, for refugee participation being included um, in, in policy? Okay, thank you for that, Rez. And I'm going to turn to Mustafa, and then we'll ask um, uh, senior advisor Co to field both sets of questions, if that's uh, if that's okay. Mustafa? Thank you so much, Eric, for the invitation. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you for everyone attending today and listening to us and having the time uh, uh, to join in the conversation. Um, and Senior Advisor Co for your remarks. Um, I, I think also my, my question would be around the topic. Uh, we, we often hear from, from different stakeholders in terms of uh, the role of the states and, and, and the role of the UNHCR and the regime and, and the international organization. And, and, and those are uh, 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 greatly important and, and no one deny it in, in, in any form. Um, yet in the convention, that's something you always see those roles being amplified and all of that, but then can they actually do everything? 
Um, maybe the best example was the recent pandemic and, and COVID-19, where we've seen that the states and, 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 and um, international organizations or even UNHCR that has a very important role in the refugee regime that were not actually enough. And the one who uh, were responding at that point were the refugees and refugee-led organizations on the ground has always been the first responders uh, to crisis. And I think more uh, clearly uh, back when, when the pandemic actually uh, uh, hit. So clearly today that kind of international regime needs to unlock the potentials of refugees, need to a bit rearrange and reshift that kind of uh, perception about refugees and like kind of a one pain that as of like all vulnerable because they are different in their situations and, and all of that. But given this and, and even the global compact on refugees, we know that paragraph 34 also indicated about, you know, the refugee uh, inclusion in those policy and design and the implementation. Uh, we've seen about over 30 countries that spoke in favor of refugee participation, just kind of, you know, to put those actors. But still, that being said, I would really would like to know, like in the light of pandemic, how do you think can the refugee regime build back better and include the RLOs as part of the planning and delivery program? And maybe kind of a more specific to the US, how do you think the Biden and Harris administration um, can leverage actually US leadership within the refugee regime, uh, trying to claim back this kind of position to enhance the role of refugee-led organization and the function of refugee regime. Harold? Uh, both of you asked an excellent question. In a way, they're, they're uh, two sides of the same coin. And I'd, I'd identify three things. One, one is, um, Rez asked, how do you turn commitment into uh, sustained uh, action? And um, I think the basic idea we're developing here is that a treaty like the Refugee Convention is not the total solution. It is a normative focal point on which public and private action and resources can converge. And that without the normative focal point, um, people don't know what principles they're fighting for um, and they don't know where to coordinate their resources, but that the treaty is more like the skeleton for the regime that uh, comes out of it. So we now have a refugee convention which addresses people across borders uh, when uh, two thirds of the people who are displaced don't cross borders. Still, there's the basic ideas are forming a kind of normative focal point in which governments and non-governmental actors and intergovernmental inter organizations can uh, coordinate their activities. Now, you notice that the same kind of thing is going on with regard to fighting the pandemic. You know, the governments are just a piece of it. Some of the governments, as you can tell, are uh, riven with conflict, but we're also uh, working with uh, nation states, state and local governments, uh, vaccine companies, um, uh, you know, intellectual property distributors, Gavi, CEPI, uh, and all of these are an effort to create a regime that can react and respond to uh, the latest uh, refugee challenges. But point two is these entities don't work without someone leading. And what we saw for the last four years is when US leadership is not there or worse, when the US is, appears to be opposed to and destructive of the regime, um, it creates massive dislocation and distrust. And um, um, I think a key of this is rebuilding a bipartisan appreciation for uh, refugees and um, how much they have contributed to our societies. Um, you know, I think it's important for somebody like Congressman Naguz to speak about his refugee heritage because he was part of the constitutional discussion about impeachment and what it means to have a constitutional democracy and what it means to violate the core principles of constitutional democracy. And um, the answer is that he is uh, every bit as much an American as the people who came over on the Mayflower. In fact, maybe someone who to whom the words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence mean more uh, because of what he struggled through to, to get here. 
Um, third, uh, I think the tricky question is how can you combine these public and private resources and norms um, to create something that's larger than the parts, to create synergies and uh, force multipliers. And I think that's the uh, essential challenge that we face. And one of the things that groups like Refugees International or other or refugee organizations do is they facilitate that communication and catalyzing function now aided by the tool of social media uh, and instantaneous communication, which didn't exist not that long ago. You know, Eric and I aren't that old, I don't think, but you know, when we started out, we didn't have, you know, the fax machine was a new thing. <laughs> and uh, and um, now, you know, the, you, you can see refugees being refiled in real time. Um, people can point to violations of the core norms immediately. And it can get immediate attention. And it doesn't have to be on a mainstream media. It can be through someone's cell phone camera. And uh, that doesn't guarantee action. So for example, we saw the Syrian refugee crisis play out horribly, but without action to address the uh, root causes. I think the great danger that we face is always this from states. Uh, which is some sort of crisis occurs, um, uh, refugees start to flow out, uh, other governments watching this don't do anything, so the first period is a period of inaction, then they start to realize that the refugee outflow is its own problem, then they react against the refugee outflow, not against the core problems, uh, and as a result of which they go into court and rationalize a response which is tough on the refugees um, and unsympathetic to human rights. And then that becomes the law. And um, it then takes a while to get back to address the root causes. I, I think back to 94 when Eric was so much of a part of the effort to restore the Haitian government because at the end of the day, the way to end the refugee outflow was to you know, bring back some semblance of democratic government in Haiti. But here we are, 2021, and, um, you know, Haiti is in crisis again. So um, it just goes to show that um, uh, it's a continuing struggle. Um, and those of us who have been at this for a while have to recognize the patterns and try to warn against repetition of bad patterns, uh, but also see the opportunities for. Uh, regime building and private public response. And I, I think that that's one of the messages of the 70th anniversary. You know, you can spend a lot of time trying to create a new focal point for the normative process, but it would take years to get a new convention or we can build around the framework with God. And that's really our, our only real option at this point, our only practical and realistic option. Um. Thank you, Harold. I'm going to turn to you, Al, in a second, but I'm also going to comment, if I may, on, on, on Rez and Mustafa's. And my comment will be very simple. Um, you know, uh, not having been in government for some years, I don't know what's already being done. And so I make this suggestion at the risk of being told that it's already happening. Um, but faced with the questions that you raised about refugee inclusion, my suggestion, if I were Assistant Secretary, uh, would be, you know, Let's create a hundred million dollar fund, uh, which represents about three percent of our overall budget, maybe less, um, and devoted exclusively to support for refugee-led organizations and global con consultations, and either channel it through UNHCR or use it, you know, um, um, on our own. Now, maybe that's already being done, but if it's not being done, I can't fathom a reason why it shouldn't be being done, and um, and. Um, you know, um, uh, um, so, and I know there are some former colleagues who are on the call, I've checked, so they now have a proposal. Um, all right, Yael, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, and so I guess I have a, a, just a, a one major question uh, for Harold. Um, as you noted in your historical discussion, non-refoulement uh, is the a linchpin of the convention. 
Um, the writers of the convention noted in its opening that, quote, the grant of asylum may place unduly heavy burdens on certain countries, but it encouraged governments to continue, the, quote, sorry, to continue to receive refugees in their territories. Um, Lewis Henkin, um, the official U.S. delegate to the committee writing the convention um, at the time, claimed that um, refoulement was not something the United States had to deal with, particularly because it was, quote, not so geographically situated as to receive many illegal entrants. So the drafters did not fully anticipate that one of today's biggest challenges for asylum seekers would be simply accessing territory, especially in the global north, or the extent to which first asylum countries would externalize refugee status determination in a way that might lead to refoulement. Further, even as additional human rights treaties, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, have incorporated an obligation of non refoulement countries like the United States have tried to limit impediments to removing non-citizens, even if it means sending them to inhumane treatment or serious harm. So basically, my basic question is, you know, how would you assess the state of non refoulement today? And what future do you see for territorial asylum specifically? Well, that was the subject, uh, Yael, of our Haitian litigation back in the 90s. And we've been litigating that issue over and over again since. You know, most of the jurisprudence of the European Convention on Human Rights has been more favorable to the refugees than has US jurisprudence. But I agree with you that you know, pushing the border out um, and externalizing these asylum determinations have been the main move. And that's what we've seen, for example, with regard to the Northern Triangle. You, you would think that the main approach ought to be administrative in the sense of huge amount more resources for asylum officers to be available at the point of contact to make a full-scale asylum determination. Uh, because, you know, there are differences between people who have bona fide asylum claims and those who don't. But we also all know from our work that asking somebody the right set of questions yields different answers. You know, you can ask someone, are you fleeing from persecution? And they say yes, because uh, I was a member of this political party and a friend of mine who was in the same party was targeted and killed. And so I think I'm going to be killed. That person's entitled to asylum. But if you ask the same person, would you want to come to America so your children have a better economic future? They'd answer yes to that too. I mean, I know my parents would have answered yes to that. And so a lot of that turns on, not on the substance of someone's case, but on how well their representatives or themselves are able to negotiate a complex and confusing legal system. Now, the, the Trump administration adopted approach of really, I think they just simply treated refugees as um, not only as not a protected status, but that a claim of refugee status was actually, in their view, an effort to circumvent the law and um, a right to be treated as criminals. And um, um, their zero tolerance policy suggested that nobody has a right to cross a border unless their legal status has been adjudicated. We, we all know that people who have a right to asylum have a right to cross a border and get their asylum adjudicated once they get to the other side. So it, by the very nature of the Trump zero tolerance policy or the remain in Mexico policy was to undo um, uh, many of these uh, uh, protections. Now, then we've layered on top of it the further complication of COVID which is accompanied by travel restrictions. And, you know, the Biden administration has on the one hand tried to liberalize the asylum rules, but on the other hand, stick to uh, COVID legitimate public health restrictions that protect the country. And we now see a resurgence of variants. And it's gonna take a while for all of this to be sorted through. You know, take a good example, which was that the Ninth Circuit's remain in Mexico decision struck down as a violation of the asylum rules, the practices of the Trump administration, 
And then the Trump administration essentially reinstated the same restrictions under the guise of a COVID restriction. So it shows that uh, these things can be used. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a shell game. So we are now in quite an unprecedented environment. You know, I mean, this is the most restricted travel environment of my adult lifetime. And, um, you know, just when we thought it was loosening up, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the restrictions are coming again. So I think it'll be a while before we know. Um, and, um, you know, someone gave me the analogy of when, when the water is so, the flood waters are so high, you can't really see what's underneath. So you have to let the water subside to determine what is the exact shape of the landscape below. And I think that's the kind of situation that we're in. Meanwhile, I think the, the Biden administration is trying to lead globally. Um, you know, for example, one way in which the Biden administration is trying to lead globally is through COVID management. And, um, you know, if, if, if the United States can bring COVID under control domestically and help people control COVID internationally, then people will believe that America can lead again and actually uh, serve global purposes. So that's been a central focus. And, um, you know, we've now reached a point at which, you know, it, we've bumped up against very heavy political obstacles. And the question is, what's the next step? But on the other hand, I think, you know, we're approaching 70% vaccination in the United States as of today, which is huge, unbelievable when you consider how, how, how quickly we've gotten here, uh, et cetera. So um, I think we're gonna have to both work on getting the floodwaters down and then trying to fix what's underneath, which we're not sure exactly what it looks like and it will take a sustained effort. And that's where having groups who have their eyes on the core objectives is so critical and important because um, you know you tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. You know, Eric and I have both, Eric remembers when I, he was in the government and I was outside and I gave him a hard time and he remembers the, the opposite when uh, you know, he, he, he went into academia and, and uh, talked to me when I was in the government and everybody does what they can do from their position. But I think if, if we maintain our common commitments, um, we, we have um, a core normative focal point around which public and private resources and energies can converge. And that's what I think we need going forward. We've got about nine minutes and um, I wanna make sure that, you know, and we've got a ton of questions and let me just tell the audience that if you've written any questions that, that require much more of an individualized response, reach out to us at Refugees International because we don't wanna be um, ignoring those, those questions. So if you have questions about your particular circumstance or particular situation, come to us as an organization and we'll try to be responsive. You know, I'm trying to think of it. I wanna get one question in because I, 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 your last comment, Harold, is, 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 is really important because we all have our roles uh, to play in different, in, in different situations. And I don't wanna, and in, 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 in you, Harold well knows that you know, in a forum like this, he's gonna get uncomfortable questions so, and, and, and he should. And one that I do wanna ask is, I mean, you, you've described a range of, of efforts in progress, um, you know, that, that, that re reflect uh, the administration's bona fides. And, and frankly, you know, I, I agree with, you know, we, 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 we laud, we applaud so many of the actions of the Biden administration uh, thus far on, on refugee protection issues. Um, the, the statement of the Secretary of the statements of the Secretary of State, where he has positioned the US government on these issues. But, but there's still questions. And, and, and I think, you know, I'm trying to find a question that typifies the concern. And so here it is. And it's how, how, how should the community, the, the advocacy community understand, and how do you explain, or how should we understand you know, relatively unequivocal statements from officials at the very highest levels that that people should just not come. Um, you know that 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 has been articulated on several occasions from ev from everyone from the president to the vice president to the secretary of homeland security, and you know I have been involved in many internal discussions where we discussed 
the importance of of attacking smuggling, uh, getting at irregular, uh, getting at uh, you know uh, criminal elements, encouraging people to use legal pathways. But all of that is pretty distinct from an unequivocal statements to to people, um, just don't come. And so how 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 should those of us on the outside, some of whom have been on the inside, understand those kinds of comments? Well, it's a good question, Eric, and I think we understand it two ways. One is, obviously, in broad messaging, you can't be too subtle. So you say, uh, if, if you're not a refugee, don't come. But if you're a refugee, come. Everybody's going to say, well, I'm a refugee, they'll come. <laughs> so it's, it's not a message that you can, you can tailor. And so what it actually turns on, and this is my second point, is that when there are qualities or characteristics that one has that they cannot change, and their only alternative is to flee, they will flee. So they'll be told not to come and they'll ignore it. You know, if you're gonna be persecuted for political reasons, and you know that they're gonna come and kill your family tomorrow, you're not gonna to listen to some US government official saying don't come, you, you really don't have a choice. Um, and you flee and you think that when I get to the other end, I'm gonna claim the legitimate basis of asylum, which is one reason why you know membership in a, a particular social group usually means uh, that you have some quality or characteristic that you cannot change to stay where you are. You have to flee, that's the only alternative. So I think it's those two things. One is nuanced messages tend not to be used in political and national security discourse, otherwise they're misunderstood. But secondly, those statements are made with full understanding that people who have bona fide refugee rights will flee and seek asylum because they have no choice. That's their only option. And they'll listen and they'll understand and they probably agree with the basic principle, but it doesn't apply to them because they are refugees. Thank you. Um, we have, um, Harold has four minutes. So I'm gonna invite each of the panelists uh, with the threat of cutting you off um, uh, to offer just maybe 30 to seconds to a minute of comments, and then I'll give uh, Harold the last word with great thanks. But we have, literally, we have four minutes. So, um, uh, so Mustafa, why don't you start, and then I'll go to Yael, and then Raz. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, and, and, and I hope I can, I can have a kind of a 30 seconds uh, with Senior Advisor Harold um, uh, still with us. Um, I think what I want to say at the end, yes, today in the absence uh, of, of the U.S. in the last four years from the world stage on so many important issues, including the refugee issue, um, it, it was unfortunate. But at the same time, there was a lot of uh, ideas. There was a lot of innovation. There was a lot of uh, um, efforts that has been done. And that kind of gives a bit of privilege today to the U.S. to kind of look at those solutions and, 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 and trying to borrow. But at the same time, it's not about borrowing the solutions, it's about leading the world. Nobody can today uh, uh, neglect the fact that the U.S. today is the biggest power, has the most diplomatic power, has the most soft power in the world today. So, I mean, on small issue and a small initiative like the one that Eric mentioned, for example, a dedicated fund to refugee-led organization, a creating a mechanism of the state's conversation with refugee inclusion, those kind of things that the, if the U.S does, it doesn't stay with the US. It gives a great power to everyone else to go to other countries and then basically duplicate and replicate the model just based on the US leadership. So here is kind of a small things that the US can do within its own territories, but could actually expand and empower many others in the world. I hope, you know, with, with your background, senior advisor, with, with your passion to the cause and working on it, something that you can help us to continue just kind of building and, and be more innovative, innovative to build a better support system for refugees. Thank you, Mustafa. That was very eloquent. Um, uh, Yael. I won't take a, a lot of time. I'll just say that, you know, I was very heartened by, you know, the, the outward looking focus that you talked about in terms of interpretation of the convention, which I think is really where we need to see the U.S. going in terms of, 
its obligations to refugees. And I, it, yes, the convention is a normative framework, but it's also, we are bound to it. It's a law, we have obligations under it. It's a treaty, it's not soft law, it's hard law for me. And I feel like that's important. So for me, the convention, an outward looking focus on our obligations um, to me is, is what I hope to see in this administration. I was excited to hear you say that. Thank you, Arez. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Senior Advisor uh, Co, for your remarks. Um, I absolutely agree with what my uh, co-managing director, Mustafa, has said. And just to emphasize on that point, I mean, um, we have obviously noted in this conversation that refugee situations have increased um, in scope and scale and complexity. And so really this does require uh, new and innovative methods for protection. Um, but I think really finding the best solutions and responses for the complex um, issues that are now uh, facing the world, um, while it requires you know, strong evidence-based research and commitment to translating findings into impact. Um, again, importantly, it requires input from people with lived experiences for the development of policies that are closer to the ground. Um, uh, and so working in partnership with leaders with lived experiences has huge potential to leverage effort and investment. So I think really this presents um, with the new um, Biden uh, Harris administration and with such passionate advocates within the um, gov government, um, this means that we now have a better opportunity for all the actors within the sector to transform how they partner with refugees in order to advance joint efforts during this global crisis and beyond. So I really look forward to um, the leadership that the US will um, go back to having after the last four years um, in this space. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Harold, the last word is yours. So um, uh, on my computer is this post-it note, four R's plus one. Um, when I started here on January 20th, I put four R's plus one on my computer. So I'd see it every day. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, reverse, re-engage, reconceptualize, and rebuild. That, that's our approach to the Trump administration's policies. One, reverse them to re-engage with the organizations they left. Third, reconceptualize our efforts in light of the efforts that have gone on despite the Trump administration, as Mustafa said. And then fourth, rebuild, build back better. And that has been sort of the motto that we've tried to follow with regard to all of these areas. So then the question is what's uh, plus one? Uh, don't forget refugees. You know, um, it is because of American asylum law that I live in America. It's because of American asylum law that I've had the opportunities I've had. And one of those is the opportunity now to serve the government four different times. And it's important that if someone's in the positions I'm in, that I remember that being a refugee is part of the project of, of America. You know, we're, we are not united by ethnicity. We're not, not united by religion. Uh, what unites us is a certain set of values, and, and one of them is the value of refugees expressed on the Statue of Liberty. And so that's why I try to remind myself, you know, as the flood of work goes over me every day, I just look at this, you know, reverse, re-engage, rebuild, and reconceptualize, and don't forget the refugees. That's been my motto until I am done. Well, uh, on behalf of Harold uh, Co, on behalf of the panelists, on behalf of um, uh, all of our guests, uh, with apologies for not getting all of their uh, questions, uh, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time and the trouble uh, to join us today. It was a real pleasure, um, and um, and we look uh, we look forward to continuing to engage in the in the months and the in the years to come. So everyone have a great day, and thank you again. Thank you.